It was Christmas morning. And Richie and his sister Sue flew down the stairs and dove straight to the bottom of the Christmas tree. Brother and sister, they grabbed the biggest packages they could find. Those that were wrapped in bright green and red, and they were marked, love, mom, and dad. Richie was hoping for the newest PlayStation game. In the big box in front of her, Susie was thinking, this has got to be Barbie's new Jeep. They ripped their presents open. Well, Susie received a huge tree of broccoli. And Richie got a large tin of Quaker Oats. Susie despised the vegetable world, especially broccoli. And even at the mention of Quaker Oats, Richie's stomach started to turn. Ooh, they both screamed. And in shock, they looked at their parents and said, okay, where's the real gifts? And mom and dad, with smiles that went from ear to ear, said, these are the real gifts. How do you like them? Well, after a few long, hard moments, the kids realized this was for real. So in order to bring some peace in the situation, Susie looked at her brother and with a big sigh said, well, you want to switch? <laughs> Friends, time and time again, life reveals itself to be immensely unpredictable. We always don't get what we want or expect. We don't always see the outcome we desire or the next chapter of life we came for ready for. We have to make split decisions. We have to change course and then wait patiently. And never is this truer for us here in this Advent holiday season, in this season of continuous COVID-19. As much as we try, we can't really determine if families will gather together for Christmas. If our travel plans will either be canceled or delayed. If you will, some part of the Christmas dinner will either be forgotten or burnt. If that one cousin will finally say, I'm sorry. Or maybe this year our uncle will finally hold his point. Or if, say, mom and dad's presence, non-presence, will be less painless. Or even if that invitation will even come. And as you and I know, there are a lot more ifs. But as much as you and I like to plan for the future, as much as you and I like to manage the presence, when it comes to our complex changing lives and the fear in our human society we are better off staying on our toes ready ready to expect the unexpected and this was true also for me as we read the scripture she, we find out she's a teenager betrothed to Joseph and for her, her plans were pretty clear. Mary and her family were eagerly anticipating the security that would come within the marriage covenant. And perhaps you and I can imagine what Mary and Joseph were imagining concerning life together. Maybe Joseph was thinking about a little carpentry shop sort of like a Home Depot meets the ancient local carpenter. Mary, maybe she was looking forward to well, passing on the Swedish traditions of her Jewish faith so that the family that was coming together would build together. And who knows? Who really knows? Everything seemingly was falling perfectly into place. Until, 
until that angel Gabriel showed up and visited Mary and went to her and said, you're going to expect a baby. And not just a baby, the son of the most high. Suddenly, all of Mary's plans went dark. This is outrageous. This is scandalized. They're scandalous. Everything now is jeopardized. To carry into the world the most holiest of gifts. No. She was actually endangering all the plans she had for her life, for her survival, for her upcoming marriage, her family's reputation, and even her personal safety. She to be a woman accused of adultery, was synonymous with a life of destitution. Even prostitution or death back in those ancient days. Think about this. Why would God put a teenager in such a dangerous, unanticipated situation? Why bless someone so unprepared with this gift that all her life's plans were unraveled? Now, the image of the angel visiting Mary has captured our, if you will, collective imaginations for centuries. We have seen many, many pictures of, if you will, our girl crouched in the corner, wearing a perfectly blue iron scarf. Her hair, every strand neatly in place. And her eyes gently, if you will, looking up to the heavens. And then there's the angel. A golden halo, a white flowing toga towering above her, as big as the room, singing out greetings. You are the favored one. The Lord's with you. Oh, and by the way, you're going to have a baby. Portraits like that can be all inspiring. But sometimes for you and me, they can be unsettling. For here you have this angel as big as life, towering over little Mary. Mary who was small, obedient, and bowing and saying, here I am. I think there's many ways to, if you will, imagine this biblical scene. And if we use our sanctified imagination, Maybe we can picture the angel and Mary talking at the kitchen table during breakfast time. Maybe sharing a cup of coffee. Maybe sharing not Quaker oats, but maybe Jewish oats. <laughs> or maybe you and I can see a angel, the angel Gabriel, in the form of a little child running up to Mary and tugging on her, eager to share the good news. Perhaps the angel. Angel talking, blowing through the wind, blowing through Mary's unkept hair. And then whispering in her ear. I think it's certainly okay to imagine this scene over and over again in new ways. Because we know that God sent angels on many occasions in different forms and unexpected ways. So we could take this part of scripture and with our sanctified imaginations, with the knowledge of salvation story in a part of mind, to once again picture what in most cases a familiar scene. And when we do this, we give Mary more clarity. More human color, if you will. More fire, shape, and dimension. For what we see is an angel inviting her. Inviting her into a conversation. Calling her into a relationship. Offering her the most unexpected gift. 
to bring God's cherished son into the world. And Gabriel is not only calling Mary to trust in God, but he's telling Mary, Mary, God is putting his trust in you. For God is saying, for with me, nothing is impossible. And Mary, responding in faith, it says, here I am. Friends, this is a profound moment of trust. See, Mary is putting her life into the hands of God. And God is putting his life literally into the hands and life of Mary. For Mary, this is an unexpected, life-shifting, faith-shaking gift. But to God, there's nothing really strange or unexpected about it because God's been waiting for Mary all along. Dr. Robert Tenenhill writes, God chooses Mary exactly because she has nothing. She's not a favored one among human society. She even says, she identifies that she's lowly and poor. But God is seeking to come to us in Jesus Christ, coming to the poor and the lonely to turn the world upside down and offer a human connection, a divine salvation to those especially who have been silenced, to those who've been persecuted for so long. In essence, God's favor of Mary is the embodiment of God's reign of justice, of love and peace, and of favor for all people, especially those who are in pain, for those who feel most undeserving. And as you and I know, the Bible is filled with stories like these. God reaching out to the unprepared, the lowly, the lost, the outcast. And God is, some, is offering something wholly unexpected. And by the I mean holy is H-O-L-Y, holy, unexpected. For if you remember, there was Moses with his stutter, called to free the Hebrew slaves in Egypt. And then they were sour, told that she would be fruitful and multiply, even though she was old and gray. The young boy Samuel, in answer to a mother's prayer, one of the great prophets of the Old Testament. We're told in the book of Samuel, three times he went to the priest Eli at the, during the night, thinking that Eli had called him. But it wasn't Eli, it was the Lord. And each time Samuel responded by saying, here I am. Well, the fourth time the Lord called him and he realized it was the Lord after Eli had told him. And he said, here I am, Lord, speak, for your servant listens. And of course, today we're looking at Mary, a child herself. And she comes talking with the angel Gabriel, and she says, here am I, the Lord's servant. And certainly don't forget Saul. With a vengeful heart, he became Paul to share the message of Christ the Savior. Biblical figures in the Old and New Testament, they were, if you will, flipped. Flipped like the houses we flip. They're transformed into something new. And they become blessed and both servants for Jesus Christ. The Bible is full of stories like this. And why? Because God chooses to work in this way, in small and big events. Someone once said, God has a habit of calling nobodies to transform them into somebodies without consulting anyone. And we are those people. God is constantly putting his trust and to those who wouldn't even make the first cut on a varsity team. God is calling them, and friends, God is calling you and me this morning to take part 
in the most sacred work of the gospel. See, God seeks you and me not despite our brokenness, our imperfections, or even our limitations, but because of it. God invites us, and we have the opportunity to be in mutual trust with Him in a world of endless possible situations. One of my favorite authors is a pastor, Max Lucado. In one of his many books, he wrote, God loves you just the way you are. Amen. But he refuses to leave you that way. He wants you and me to be just like Jesus. So what's it going to take in this Advent season? What's it going to take for you and me to have that kind of courage, that obedience, that faith, if you will, that puts them in this season of unexpected diseases and transitions to take the, Mar the words of Mary and declare with her, here I am. Here I am. Because to say here I am is to be willing to put all your plans, all my plans aside and to follow Jesus wherever he's going to lead us. To say here I am is to trust in God who places his trust in you and me to bring about a loving and peaceable kingdom here on earth. To say here I am is to believe in our hearts the words of the angel. Nothing is impossible with God. Years ago, a group of seminarians went to El Salvador to study the life of Archbishop Oscar Romero and other religious leaders and organizations who advocate for the justice of the poor. If you remember in the 70s and 80s, hundreds and thousands of El Salvadorians immigrated to the United States to escape war and persecution. During that time, there were 14 families in El Salvador that had all the wealth and all the power. And if you spoke out, if you resisted, you were made to go away, disappear forever. Even the cherished Oscar Romero was gunned down while performing a mass. And a whole village was massacred to send a son. No rebellion. One afternoon, the group of seminarians sat down to talk with General Francisco Mena and a young woman named Evelyn Romero, just to hear their story. At the time when the conflict was at its highest, Evelyn was about 17 years old. Resources in her little rural village of El, El Rosario, well, they were scarce. People were starving to death. Evelyn remembers cutting up little pieces of bread so that everyone would have at least something to eat every day. Well, during that time, General Mena received orders to go into that village and murder 4,000 men, women, and children. In other words, wipe them out. And although he had deep reservations about this gruesome mission, he was told by his superiors there might be rebels and ruffians hidden in that town. And the general thought, orders are orders. So he took his men and they gathered all the townsfolk into the village square. People were either crying or praying or screaming. Evelyn held tight to her rosary beads. At one point, the general pulled Evelyn aside and he shouted at her, where are the weapons? We know you're hiding them, where are they? 
Evelyn, trembling, took a deep breath and said, can't you see? We don't have any weapons here. We're hungry. The general shouted even louder, then where are the rebels? Bring them out. Can't you see? There are no rebels here. We're hungry. We need food. We don't need bullets. We need bread. General Mena said that her bold words hit him like the Holy Spirit washing over him. He said, my conscience told me to trust this woman, to trust her words, to trust her strength, to trust her pain, and to do whatever I could to lay my life on the line, knowing what was right in my soul. Well, quickly, the general got on the intercom and real quick, planes came over and start, started dropping packages, boxes of food. The soldiers were told to move on. The people went back to the village. And the general, well, he abandoned his post and joined the country's resistance. Now, there may not have been an angel there, at least maybe not one that the seminarians could see. But God was there calling out loud and clear, and there was expectation. Yes, there was fear and trust, incarnation. There was relationships, obedience, surprise. There was salvation. There was the holy and transformation. And because of that, those folks changed their world. Now, that story is also the story of us. See, God calls you and me in dramatic and in simple ways. Sometimes with a loud voice. Sometimes with a whisper. Sometimes towering over, over us. Sometimes sitting across the kitchen table. God calls us again and again into a mutual trust. He calls us into a relationship. He says in the book of Revelation, here I stand, here I am, and I stand at the door. Behold, I knock, and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in, and I'll dine with you, and you will dine with me. And just like those kids and their gifts, friends, this food is for you. God calls you and me into unexpected future. And God doesn't promise that you and I are always going to have a holiday hallmark moment. Free of any kind of struggle or sorrow or even pain. God doesn't really promise you and me that we won't have a high mountain to climb. He doesn't promise that you and I will be without moments of doubt and anger and fear. But what he does promise that a life of faith is where no matter what happens, Hope abounds. Salvation is ever possible. Peace is a reality. Joy and love is, on, is overwhelming. And you and I will never walk the path this side of heaven alone. Why? Because God is Emmanuel. God is with us. Friends, that's the gift worth receiving. This is the gift that can change the world. And this is the gift that starts with, here I am. Here I am. Let's pray. Praise to God, we thank you for your word. 
and especially the example of Mary this morning. As these days of Advent, Advent are winding down, how we go and grow closer to Bethlehem. Grant us the faith to hear your call in our lives, the wisdom to expect the unexpected, and the courage and strength to shout and live your salvation before all the world, and certainly to your glory. In the name of the Prince of Peace, now and forevermore.